Good morning. Thank you for joining me on today's Cutting the Fat in Construction webinar. Let me start by making what I think is a rather bold statement. If I were to win the lottery tomorrow, there's a particular aspect of this stuff that we're going to look at today that I would do for the rest of my life. Not until retirement, but for the rest of my life for free. <clears throat> I think there's a massive gap in the education system that is totally underexploited to the detriment of real, robust and knowable improvement. I think that's pretty bold. You're going to have to decide for yourselves, but I'd be genuinely interested in any feedback. My name is Mark Woods. I'm a director of Statius. Uh, and in order to build a bit of credibility, we've worked with both large and small construction companies for nearly 30 years. The big guys are people like Hock Teeth, the international civil engineering company, 150 million pound ground working company, 100 million pound fit out company to name but a few. But our core customer base, our sweet spot really is SMEs, privately owned firms of varying sizes, the smallest probably a million or so, perhaps a general builder, up to 20 million pound roofing contractor and pretty much anything in between. And we're looking for ambitious owner managers that are wanting to grow themselves and their team. So our mission is to help ambitious owners and managers become better leaders. We want to help them and their team improve the way in which their work works. And we believe any type of management, measurement, system, initiative, project or process, whatever, should be a lubricant. If the things we're doing are not working as lubricants, if what you do and what we are not doing is not working to improve how your work works, there's something wrong. And essentially this means we want to help you generate and deliver better strategies, better systems, better measurement, my favorite bit as you'll see later, <clears throat> and engaged people delivering the bit that you're actually interested in, the better results. So what's the agenda? We're going to take a peek at some figures from the Lean Construction Institute. We're going to look at a process for reducing waste. We'll set out the foundation with some principles and a core activity map before we begin to look at the tools that we might use to cut the fat in construction and how we might measure this and how we might know if a change is in fact an improvement. They are different. So first, let's take a peek at these figures from the Lean Construction Institute. They've categorised construction work into three different components. Value creating work, which they claim is only 5 to 10% of all of the work undertaken. Work that is necessary to support the value creation work, which they estimate to be 30 to 35% of the work undertaken. And waste, a massive 60, uh, 55 to 65% of all of the work done. Now, most people do take objection to the above figures, but regardless of whether or not they believe the figures, everybody I've ever spoken to believes that you can always do something to be more effective and more efficient. The question is how? What's the process? <clears throat> and that's what we're going to be discussing today. So I'm pretty sure this is not the only process, nor is it necessarily in the order we'll, everyone will work to, but it is one we have used a number of times and it's one that has worked. Select the team. In discussing this process with clients, I usually suggest we adopt a lesson I learned the first time I was a very junior member of a planning team. And that was to get somebody with, let's call them kind of contrarian, uh, yeah, contrarian views and get them on the team. And after we've converted them to our way of thinking, they'll do the job of converting any other dissenters far better than we ever will. Explain the definitions and principles in this case, things like value, flow, pull, and even perfection. Define the process for improving a process, actually easier than you might think. And we're going to dip into this, but in true Blue Peter fashion, we've developed a complete how-to detailing a five-step, step-by-step process. And this will be available as on the download link you'll be sent. I think there's also something in sharing your plans with others. You nail your colors to your masts. Uh, or to mix metaphors, you deliberately back yourself into a corner so that there is only one way out, and that's forward. 
and then ensuring you celebrate success when key milestones are hit. So, creating the team. It's my belief that improvement processes like these cannot completely be subcontracted out to people like us. You need to engage and train your team to improve your processes. This usually means there's a skills transfer process from us to you. We will help you develop the thinking, the tools and the techniques, what we call the three T's, necessary to cut the fat in construction. And that usually begins with things like the principles. This is about defining what the customer values, what the client will pay for. And it may be different for different clients. The value stream is about understanding the flow of work through your processes. That is from initial tickle where the customer says, can you do X or Y to the point where the job is completed and you've satisfied the client. At Statius, when we codify this, we call this a core activity map. Flow is about balancing the flow of work across the project and through the core activity map. And sometimes having less people on a site speed things up because they don't get in the way of one another. In other instances, flow is about information in the form of drawings produced to a schedule and then pulled from the design team leader. Flow is about breaking out of the silos that sometimes exist when thinking about the organization in family tree terms. Flow is about the upstream pull of work through the activities as detailed on the core activity map, which means organizing systems and processes to design and deliver value as the customer has defined it and pulled through the system for delivering it. Perfection. Now, wouldn't that be nice? <clears throat> Perfection is an, obviously an ideal, but the underlying theme here is continually striving to do better. It's about the process of improving a process. Which we describe in much more detail than we have time for to go into today in the how to that you can download. But essentially it's a five step process, improvement process to help guide a team through an improvement project to deliver a better process. It involves the setting up of the team, the definition of the as is process, and then the application of relevant thinking tools and techniques, some of which we'll discuss in a moment, to help you identify process inefficiency and help generate uh, ideas for ways in which to solve the issues. These ideas are then addressed to decide the best way forward, which is then defined as the to be process. <coughs> So the first stage of which is to map out your existing processes, how you currently deliver value. We start with a deliberately simple business mo process model, our get job, do job, get money model. However you define them, it's these processes that we want to make slicker, faster, better, cheaper, whichever adjective you choose to apply in order to cut the fat from construction. And in very simple terms, you invest cash in, a uh, cash out at the beginning of the cycle and on site setup, materials, equipment, staff, subcontractors, and you get cash back in at the end of the cycle when the customer hopefully pays. Additionally, as some of that cash is often delayed by a year or more with retentions, cash can take a long time to come back into the business. Use properly these core activity maps with complementary thinking tools and techniques and proper performance measures can help you eliminate waste from your processes and improve your cash to cash cycle. So the get job, do job, build job concept simply provides a starting point. Let's look at a real core activity map for one construction company, along with a few associated key performance indicators. This is just one example of a construction processes. In most companies, most companies are in various ways unique depending on how they're structured. The key points are, <coughs> we have defined the value stream, the flow of work using the company's terms and terminology, making it accessible and understandable. And we've begun to link those core processes to KPIs. For reasons more to do with clarity of the slide, more than anything else, we haven't included the other things that the company and the customer might be interested in. So other measures might include the number and value of tenders, the percentage win rate, the tender response time, the percentage of jobs completed on time or on budget. 
there are obviously many other KPIs we can assign to the core activities. This top level diagram would then drill down to lower level swim lane flowcharts, showing amongst other things, responsibilities, activities, and key decision points. This shows the first part of the processes for reviewing an order or letter of intent. The roles of the various organizations and individuals can seen along the top on in blue. The gray boxes show the activities undertaken and the blue diamonds show a decision. In this case, whether or not to accept the order and the green dots are where others are informed. Having mapped this current as is process, we can begin to pick it apart and see not only what works well, but more importantly, what doesn't work so well. So we can pick apart processes and assign frequencies and costs to the things that don't work well, which provide data on which to make decisions about which part of the processes to improve. At this lower level, we can also apply other KPIs and metrics, which we might be interested in. Accident and injury rates, which we're going to delve into in a little while, a little deeper. Health and safety audit scores, adherence to programs and drop lines, project profitability, profitability, actual versus budget. Then there are the tools which we can employ in order to make those improvements we're seeking. Time constraints aren't going to allow us to go into detail about all of them, but some of them include things like Timwood, Seacar, and Ishikawa. Let's look at these. Tim Woods, probably the most well-known tool, and thankfully no relation of mine, uh, is focused on waste. All processes will have a degree of waste, and the Tim Woods framework helps you think systematically about and eliminate waste issues. So, transportation, unnecessary movement of things, plant, equipment, materials between processes or indeed sites, unnecessary inventory, in th essentially things ordered and on site early or unnecessarily. Well, work in progress, but it could be extra copies of tenders. The point is it's stuff sitting around, which is not having value added to it. Unnecessary movement of people between processes or sites, perhaps taking the good guys off the end of projects before completion and moving them onto the next project and upsetting the original customer as you do. Unnecessary overproduction, unnecessary processing, and unnecessary defects. Uh, the defects of both processes and products or service in, in construction, this could include early warning to subcontractors or snaggings. Now, depending on the process or activity being studied, some of these activities are going to apply more than others. It's not a one size fits all approach. And the counterpart tool to Tim Woods is CCAR where Tim would help to identify waste, CCAR helps deal with it. The idea is to work down the list for each waste. Start with simplify. If you can't do that, move to eliminate and so on. In order to avoid coming to a solution that may not work for others in the organization, this part of the process should be tackled as a team rather than as an individual. So running workshops is a good way of involving the whole team to identify and get buy-in to the methods of eliminating waste. Ishikawa, given that part of what we're doing is to eliminate problems, it's critical to explore everything that might cause a problem before you start thinking about solutions. The Ishikawa or cause effect analysis is a brilliant tool for doing just this. I originally came across Ishikawa, sometimes called fishbone diagrams or herringbone diagrams when studying engineering. It developed the diagrams in order to show the causes of specific events. This partially complete 5M model, where the head of the fish describes the problem, project delay, and the bones of the fish are indicative of one or more of the following issues. The machine, which might include equipment or technology, methods or processes, design, specifications, risk assessments, materials, raw materials, components, subcontractors. Man is about your people, but might also include subcontractors. And measurement relates to your checking and inspection processes, as well as perhaps valuations and variations. However, over the years, the model has been developed originally to include original three 
three extra M's. So mission, management and maintenance. But if these labels don't work, create your own. These tools should never be about slavish adherence to the tool. They should be about using and where necessary abusing the tool to drive your thinking. There are a range of other tools that can be employed to ensure your processes become quicker, slicker and smarter. But because of the constraints of time, we don't have time to go into those today, but they do include things like benchmarking, brainstorming, 5S, stratification, check sheets, scatter diagrams. But using these tools is not enough if we need to know we've improved, cut the fat and reduce the waste. Tools are merely a vehicle for driving the improvement. If we want to know we've improved, we need to collect some data. So why do we collect data? Well, I think we collect data to convert information into knowledge and communicate it, to provide a check on current performance, to facilitate decisions and take appropriate action, and establish if the actions taken have had the desired effect. But I'm not sure the current methods we have at our disposal are actually helping us. But before we drill into some data, let's just take a step back and consider. Data is not information, information is not knowledge, knowledge is not understanding, and understanding is not wisdom. So I think, and again, you may have a different opinion, the monster mother of all tools is something called a control chart. We like to call it the process prediction or process performance chart. The idea behind all of these tools is they make your process better, slicker, faster. And the effective use of data will be the only way we have of knowing that we've done that. Variation is the virus that destroys process predictability and the process prediction chart connected to your key performance indicator can be the antidote to the virus of variation. So we now link the processes to the core activity maps to relevant KPIs to tease out the measures that the customer might be interested in and then to look at your own internal measures. We have a whole raft of data from a whole range of construction organisation involved, uh, involved in construction, invoice sales, orders one, cash in the bank, project margin, much of which is obviously sensitive. And whilst I could desensitise the data, I actually wanted to use a lower level and perhaps more emotive measure. We have an obligation to make sure our people go home at night safely. So I'm going to explore accident frequency rate. This is real data from a reasonable sized construction company. There is an obvious spike in the data from July when the monthly rate crept up significantly. And I'm pretty sure somebody got castigated for this. But is it really a spike? Additionally, their year ends in October, at which point the analysis begins again. They forget their entire KPI history. Madness. So let's look at the same data, but on a performance prediction chart. We can see it's the same data, just differently displayed with a green line at the top, which is calculated from the data and denotes the limits of process capability. And from this, we can see what appears to be the spike in July is actually within the bounds of statistical expectation. We might not like it, but the process will deliver what the process will deliver. If we don't like it, we need to change the process somehow. One of my favourite questions when looking at data this way is that when we see the highest or lowest number that we've seen for some time, is, is that number in fact important or indeed significant? In this case, the answer is absolutely not. So this approach results in a different decision making process. We know the result seen is within the bounds of expectation, we no longer take the knee-jerk reaction. Additionally, if we don't refresh the data every year, but instead look at the wider view of data, by going back and adding in the previous year's data, we can see an even bigger picture. Here we can see that in actual fact, the accident frequency is nearly halved. But because of every year we start the analysis anew, we lose this in insight. 
we have some charts with five years or more of data showing multiple process improvements. The thing is, the most common approach to data do not usually place data in any kind of context. They all take a limited, selective and static snapshot view of the data. This month, last month, and if we're dead lucky, this time last year. Additionally, we can now predict the future. We can't predict a single point, but we can predict the range of expectation. The dotted lines projected into the future now suggest that unless we do something fundamentally different to fun, fundamentally different, our accidentally accident frequency rate will sit somewhere below the top green line with an average of 2.4 per month, the blue line. So the conclusion we can draw is that it's only if, if a result sits outside the dotted green lines that we need to investigate that particular result. So if we want to bring the overall accident average down further, we need to draw another tool into our armory. That tool is the Pareto analysis. So we now need to look at all of the data over the entire period. Wilfredo Pareto worked out in the early 20th century that 20% 20 of Venetians held 80% of Venetian wealth. So this is sometimes called the 2080 or the 8020 rule. As a guide, a lot of processes fall into this categorization. 20% of your customers will deliver 80% of your profits. 20% of your materials purchase will equate to 80% of your materials cost. And conversely, 80% of your issues will be caused by 20% of your problems. Obviously, it's not always exactly 80-20 or 20-80, which is just a rule of thumb. It's sometimes called the law of the vital few over the trivial many. The point is, if you look at all of the data over the period and you use Pareto to identify the vital few issues that are causing problems, you can then work on those problems to reduce or eliminate them from the entire data set or period. Having removed the big problems, all of a sudden you get a step change in process improvement. Returning to the usual this month, last month, this time last year snapshot view of numbers, usually presented in some form of table where you've got no hope of spotting a trend. This is an approach best summed up with a great quote by the scholar, statistician and risk analysis, a guy called Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He's written some great books on stats and numbers. The Black Swan about unforeseen events being one and fooled by randomness being another. And he says, it's as if we want to be wrong with infinite precision rather than being approximately right. So what are the lessons learned? Well, they're profound. Most of us would agree that it's absolutely pointless uh, trying to explain the fine detail of results obtained when throwing a dice or tossing a coin. So what if we get a large number of heads than normal? We all know that if we toss a, toss a coin, say 50 times, on average, we'll get 25 heads and 25 tails. However, I don't think any of us would expect to get 25 heads or 25 tails every time we toss a coin. In fact, if we toss a coin 50 times, the number of heads or tails we can actually get varies between 14 and 36. It's not likely that you'll get a 14 or 36 regularly, but that wide degree of spread is within the range of expectation. That's just a feature of the process. There's nothing special about it. So the process will deliver what the process will deliver. The process capability may be very different to your requirements or your customers requirements or even your boss's requirements. There are often very large variations, even in stable systems. 14 to 36 with an average of 25 when tossing a coin. We are conditioned to find reasons for figures in data when there are none. Variation is usually attributable to the system and not the people. And if improvement is required, if fat in construction is to be cut or waste is to be eliminated, we need to change the system. 
investigating single data points will not usually help us unless that data point appears outside the green line of expectation. There are a number of blogs and papers on the website which explore these details separately. Uh, applying science to the art of management and another targets goals and other management myths being the most relevant, I think. They're all free, so please feel down to, to download them. And if you want more, let me know and I'll send you some of our as yet unpublished papers. So if we're not using the performance prediction chart approach, what are we actually doing? We're comparing two, possibly three numbers or points of data this month, last month, and this time last year. We're drawing a conclusion and we're taking some action. Simple, obvious and wrong. What are we really doing? We're taking data out of context. We're taking no account of noise in the system. We're looking at photos or snapshots when we should be looking at the performance prediction chart. We could effectively be looking at a movie of data. So what? There are obviously a couple of ways to grow and improve and to reduce waste. Simply to do more of what we're already doing, more of the same, and to improve what we've got. That is using the three T's, the thinking, the tools and the techniques to really improve how our work works in order to cut the fat in construction. Clearly, these two approaches are not mutually exclusive and our job as leaders and managers is when we're looking to improve processes. Narrow the green lines, reduce the variation and move the average up if up is good. As we've seen, up is always not always good. Just think of accidents or indeed debtor days. We want less of those. So how do we do this? We need to, to use the three T's, the thinking and the tools and the techniques so that you with your people can make significant improvements in your own processes. I get excited by the numbers, but they're not actually the important bit. The important bit and our job as leaders as managers is to unleash the creativity of your people to, to use the three T's to make changes that deliver real and quantifiable improvement in your processes in line with the purpose of your organization. The subject of a different webinar. And as said, this cannot be entirely subcontracted out to us. You and possibly we need to engage and train your team to improve your processes, but the results, given that you do, can be astounding. This is a way of thinking across the whole value stream and not a series of ad hoc improvement projects. But typically for each improvement project, we'd anticipate a return on investment of between three to one and five to one. One way to think about what we do is we have the thinking, the tools and techniques to help you transform your organization. We have a kit bag of skills, but you need to run your organization. We'll never be contracts managers. We'll never be projects managers or site foremen. We need to work together with you so that with your people, we transfer some of these skills to cut the fat in construction in order to drive cash to your bottom line. One last example of real waste reduction. Here we were investigating the percentage of on-site construction jobs completed as promised and against program. We can see for the first part of the year, job closeout average is just over 55%. We can then see that after taking some action and making various changes to the process, the average has increased. Firstly to 70% or thereabouts, uh, and then and then after a second round of improvement to over 80%, I think it's 84%. This is a significant improvement in efficiency and a dramatic reduction in the chaos with increased capacity filtered straight through to the bottom line. But there's just one key performance indicator. Most people will want to see a number of them. And these will be different for different levels of managerial and operational staff. And for best effect, these measures will need to connect both up and down and across the organization. As such, each role will require its own set of key performance ind uh, indicators and an associated dashboard or performance prediction charts, which can be very easily placed on a dashboard like this to give an overall view and from which drill down functionality into one or more charts can be employed. 
Additionally, as shown here, the charts and arrows automatically turn red for bad news and green for good news. So, in summary, inevitably an initiative like this will take time, effort, money and focus, but the results can be astonishing. The Lean Institute suggests that 55 to 65 percent of what a construction company does is actually waste. That's frightening. But if any, even if only half true or a quarter true, think about that in terms of your turnover. We've talked a bit developing a map of your core processes, which we can connect to key performance indicators. We've employed the process prediction chart, which shows us the difference between a change and improvement and more than that provides us with the wisdom to make better decisions from better data which when married with your people applying the three t's the thinking tools and techniques of improvement they can cut the fat from your organization and deliver for you knowable improvement So we sometimes find that these ideas are in concept quite simple, but sometimes tricky to implement. Some may need adapting to suit particular circumstances. So if you'd like a bit of help in applying these tools to your own company, give me a call or drop me an email. We can chat about how it might work for you. So what's next? We can talk, agree a time for a video or a phone call, either as a one-to-one -one or a conference call. You might like it to take it from here on your own, or you might simply want to know about future events. But the first point of call is probably to download the presentation along with supporting information we've made available to you. You'll be sent an email with the link. One final thought, whether or not you understand statistics, I can guarantee you're already using them and we may only be saved from disaster because we're doing the wrong thing badly. So I'll now make all of you an offer. I'm more than happy to process some of your data. It does not usually take long, and I understand some of the data might be sensitive. So I'm happy to sign NDAs. This is my passion. I really want to help people make better decisions from better data to make real and quantifiable improvements in their processes. I want to get this sinking into boardrooms. Finally, I'd like to extend my appreciation to the sponsors, independent financial advisors specialising in entrepreneurs. Jurovian Wealth, great guys for the owner manager to chat to. In fact, just last week, they have completely re rewired my head and my father's head with regard to inheritance tax planning. Our purpose is to help you deliver better strategies, better systems and better measurement. That's this stuff and engage people delivering better results. Thank you for listening. I hope it's been helpful.